Welcome to Regeneration Life Church. The title of this message is Jesus, the Divine Light. Our text is John 1, verses 4 through 9. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. If this message touches your heart and inspires your mind and teaches you, please share it with your friends and family, either on Facebook or from our YouTube channel. And please hit that like button. Every like is like an amen. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 tells us, For God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Or for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This shows a link between the second creation, which is the regeneration, born again experience, that takes place in all true believers, and the first creation. The first creation, of course, is in Genesis 1, 1 through 4. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and, divide, and God divided the light from the darkness. The second creation, inside of you. In the beginning, God created you. Actually, you were born, and God, God was involved in, in your making, of course. The spirit was without godly form. Your spirit. Without godly form, void of the Lord and in darkness. Then the Spirit of God moved on you. God gave you light. Then God divided the light that is now in you from the darkness of the rest of humanity. On to our verse-by-verse -verse preaching of John 1, 4 through 9. John 1, 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The Christ life is light. The Christ life, first of all, is eternal life. John 3.15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 10.28, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. John 5.24 shows us the Christ life is everlasting life. John 5.24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. The Christ life is immortality, 2 Timothy 1.10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And the Christ life is resurrection life, Romans 8.11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the, from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Light and life are connected in many places in Scripture. We see it in Job 3.20, Job 33.28, Psalm 27.1, Psalm 36.9, Proverbs 6.23, Proverbs 16.15, John 8.12, 2 Timothy 1.10. Okay, what we just read. Light and life are connected in these verses. Light and life are linked many times for good reason. Light, or light, okay, I said the right thing. Light is required for life. In the physical, there can be no life without light. No life. Photosynthesis is the ultimate source of food energy. Plants create their own food from sunlight. Animals eat the plants, other animals eat those animals. We eat both animals and plants. Yep, some animals eat both like us. But animals cannot make their own food. They can only eat other things. Without photosynthesis, there's no food energy and everything dies. Photosynthesis also provides oxygen for breathing. <coughs> Plants use carbon dioxide in the photosynthesis process. The molecule is broken down into carbon and oxygen. The carbon is used and the oxygen is released. If there's no light, there's no oxygen for animals to breathe, and everything dies. Light is also used to sanitize, to kill germs, 
Thank you. Appreciate it. Light is also used to sanitize and to kill germs that can cause sickness and death. Just like the physical, the spiritual life requires light as well. John 8, 12, Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Well, we find in John 3, 19-20, <clears throat> that darkness, or in darkness rather, is death. This is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. 1 John 2.11 tells us that darkness blinds eyes. He, he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. The unsaved folks are in darkness and don't know where they're going. John 12.35 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not where he goeth. Listen. People think they're going to heaven. But if they're still in darkness, they have no idea that they're walking toward eternal judgment. 1 John 1.6 If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. But God translates men out of darkness into light according to Colossians 1.12-13 Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Ephesians 5, 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light, and the Lord walk as children of light. So he that follows Christ has the light of life. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 12, 46, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth in me should not shall should not abide in darkness. God calls us out of darkness into light. 1 Peter 2, 9. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Folks, that means we can't stay in darkness. We can't stay in darkness. I am come, enlightened into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. John 12, 46. 1 John 1, 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. John 1, 5 shows us that the light shineth in darkness. We don't have to go too much uh, into detail about physical or the physics of light. When you're in darkness, you flip on a switch, you connect to functional light circuit, the light illuminates whatever room in which you find yourself. In fact, we have made our own substitutes for the light of day as men and women. Women had a had place in that too. Starting with fire, they would burn fire, and that fire would, would, lighten, them, would lighten the area around them. Kerosene lamps, and now we have electric light so that we can have light even at night when the sun isn't shining. And all you have is the moon. Well, the sun is shining, it's just not shining on you. <laughs> all right. According to our perception, the sun is not shining. It's somewhere else. And actually, the sun stays put. We're the ones that move. Okay. Man, I'm getting myself in trouble. I, I'm a, I, I used to be a science teacher. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. And just like this, People try to also come up with their own substitutes for the spiritual life. For example, the New Age and false religion. This includes... Oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble again. Guys, this includes copycat Christian religions. That try to... And I use Christian in quotes. That try to substitute works or watered-down faith for the born-again experience in which you are spiritually resurrected and regenerated in Christ. There are a lot of copycat Chris, Christian religions. They don't believe the Bible. They add to the Bible. They take away from the Bible. They, 
they twist what Scripture means to suit their own ends. They're there. I, I've heard the preachings. I, I used to have commentaries by these people, and I'd read that and I'd go, where did they get that? That's crazy. They got it from their own minds. They're, they're preaching from their own minds. They're writing from what they think instead of what God's Word actually says. Okay, now I'm not saying that, that I'm right about everything. Okay? I'm not. Okay, if you can prove me wrong, I will listen to you. I'm not right about everything, but I take the Word of God seriously. And there are people out there, who, you know, we can disagree on minor issues, but if you take the Word seriously and you say this is the Word of God and we are not going to deviate from the Word of God, we might disagree on something. Somebody's wrong. Okay, it might be me, it might be you. But the fact of the matter is we are not creating a copycat Christian religion that a lot of people and a lot of churches do these days. All right, we think about, if you want to go back to, to um, the time of Moses, they had an idol, a golden calf, because God was up on the mountain. They had an idol, golden calf, and they called it Elohim and Adonai. The golden calf was given two of the names that God has reserved for himself. And that's exactly what people are doing a lot of times. <clears throat> Instead of following the true Christ, they're creating an idol in their hearts that they call Jesus. And that is not the true light. Remember, darkness causes blindness and darkness blinds your eyes. Darkness also blinds the heart, Ephesians 4.18. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Also, sinful man runs from the light into darkness. John 3, 19 and 20, this is a condemnation. The light has come into the world that men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They loved their sin, folks. For everyone that doeth evil, and that's a continual doing, it's not a slipping up. Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest its deeds should be reproved. The Holy Spirit is going to reprove that person of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Hey, that's a sin. Don't do it anymore. People don't want to hear that. Okay, Nietzsche. I read about uh, the philosopher Nietzsche who had said basically that, that God had, had touched his heart and that he said, God, you, you do your own thing and I'll do my own thing and, and I, I don't ever want to hear from you again. And then Nietzsche wrote as though he was an agnostic or an atheist because he saw the light and he ran from it. He felt the light and he ran from it. He experienced light and he ran from it back into his own philosophy. And the man went insane. And that's, if you want to get right down to it, sin makes you crazy, spiritually crazy. Listen, I used to have a roach problem in one of the places I lived. Now, if anybody's had roaches, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You walk in the place, you turn on the light, and they scatter. They run back into darkness. Now, I'm not calling unbelievers roaches. That's not what I'm trying to do. They are made in the image and likeness of God. I'm simply making a connection to the behavior. They run. The light shines, and they run from it. They run back into darkness. The one who is in Christ runs to the light. If God has touched you, you run to the light. You open your heart to the Lord. You run to His light. In fact, we have become lights ourselves to the world. Now, we're not the light, and we'll show that in a minute. Christ is the light in us. Matthew 5, 14-16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Moving on. John 1, 15. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. See, darkness cannot understand light. Now, the Greek word here can also mean um, overcome or extinguish, okay, or, or even not accept. Okay, we know darkness does not accept light, 
How can darkness accept an enemy that defeats it every time it shows up? We know that certainly darkness is at war with light, and darkness cannot overcome or extinguish light. That is true. Satan tried to destroy the Messianic line repeatedly, and he failed. Satan tried to have the Lord slaughtered. Satan then tried to attempt uh, to, to tempt, attempt to tempt the Messiah uh, to sin. Satan tried to extinguish Christ's light many times, and now he is he's trying to extinguish uh, our light through many different means. The light that is in us, the Christ's light that shines through us. But Jesus rose from the dead to prove he has power over the three D's. Yes, we're getting three D today. Darkness, the devil, and death. Jesus rose from the dead to prove his power over darkness, the devil, and death. Darkness cannot overcome or extinguish light. Now, I'm aware this may be possibly a, the, a Greek word with a double meaning or some kind of pun. I get it. But for our purposes, we want to rely on the context that we've been given. John 1.10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Okay? So the proper translation based on this evidence, based on this contextual evidence, is darkness comprehended it not. So the context shows that this verse is related to knowledge and understanding. John 1, 5. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Comprehended it not. Didn't understand. Hologram is a great illustration here. Hologram is a fascinating thing. Okay? A holographic picture is a three-dimensional... Wow, we're back to 3D. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize that until right now. Holographic picture is a three-dimensional picture. You can actually move the picture and see behind whatever is in the front. If you lose part of it, you might lose resolution, but you still have the entire picture. The picture's intact. The holographic picture to the naked eye looks like it's all clouded. It, it looks like a, 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 a problem in the development room. Okay, Maybe overexposure. You cannot see it simply by looking at it. You need the light that, that created it. You need the light that first created that hologram in order to see what's there. The only way to understand a hologram is to put it under the light that created it. It's the same with God's truth, folks. The naked eye looks like a bunch of old stories and fables, no cohesion. In fact, much of it doesn't even make sense to the natural man. It's not a surprise. You read it and you're like, why is that there? What, what does that have to do with this? This just looks like a bunch of old stories. That's, that, there, there's what. In reality, if you shine the light that created it, you find out that it is actually one story from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation. It's one story and everything connects. But the natural man can't see that. 1 Corinthians 2.14, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. It isn't until you shine the light on it that created it, that you can finally see the whole picture, and Jesus is that light. We look at a lot of the Old Testament things, there's a lot of confusion. Why are these things here? A lot of these things don't make sense. What benefit is there? reading about the tabernacle, why, how it was constructed, and, and, and all of the... All, it just it bogs you down. Why is this even here? Why do we need to know about the tabernacle? And then you look at it with the eyes of Christ, and you go, oh, that points to Jesus. This is this, and this is this. And wow, this is amazing. But until you have that light, you just look at it, and you go, why, why is he talking about so many cubits? What does that have to do with anything? What, why, why, what does it matter what size it is? What does it matter what's in it? Jesus gives the light to understand that. In fact, you can even, if you don't have Jesus, you can read a commentary that explains it perfectly. And you look at it and you go, I don't see it. I don't understand. What is he talking about? What does that have to do with it? But if you have Jesus, you can understand it. John 5.39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, is what Jesus said in 5, John 5.39. Luke 24-27, uh, 
and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, <clears throat> Christ on Emmaus after the resurrection, explaining the Old Testament. He expounded it unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. But then we have 2 Corinthians 3 14 through 16 that says of the unbeliever, their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth, actually it's the unbelieving Jewish people that this is a reference to, unbelieving Israel. Their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when they shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. They will finally understand. Jesus is the lens by which we see the truth of God revealed in the Bible. Through Christ we see that the Old Testament is in the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. When the light of God comes to one who is in darkness, the devil takes the knowledge away from them who simply will not understand. 2 Corinthians 4, 3-4, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Matthew 13, 19 has a similar concept, talking about the seed of the word of God being given to, to people of bad soil. People who, it's like people would walk on the soil and would get so compacted that you would cast seed on it and seed could not get into the soil. And it's the same way with, the, with a lot of people's hearts. So the, 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 the word picture is seed. But the concept is the same thing. Matthew 13, 19, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. It is clear, these are men who refuse to understand. They refuse to open their hearts and their minds and their eyes. Proverbs 18.2 says, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. And again, we talk about John 3.16. The condemnation is that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. But God gives enlightenment to them who will. Who will open up to it. Who will believe. Ephesians 1.17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father... Let's go ahead and read 18.2. The Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Luke 24.45 essentially gives us the same message. Okay? Then open He their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. And these men of, uh, of Emmaus were believers, and God opened their understanding. So, essentially, the same knowledge the devil stole from people, God gives to those who have an open heart to believe it. Okay? The same seed that was that was cast that couldn't get into the soil. In Luke 8.15, God says, or Jesus, Jesus, God, Jesus is God. So God says. <laughs> But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. As we consider the things of God, the Lord will give us understanding in all things. 2 Timothy 2.7 God's statutes rejoice the heart and enlighten the eyes to receive them. Psalm 19.8 God gives you all riches of the full assurance of understanding, the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2, 2 and 3. God even manifests His very mystery to the saints. Colossians 1, 26. This is not to say that the children of light understand everything. We don't. According to 1 Corinthians 13, 12, we see, still see through a glass darkly. We don't know everything. But we are growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. We still disagree, as I said before, and uh, some are in minor error here and there. It's not anything to disfellowship over, whether you believe that the, the rapture happens uh, pre-tribulational, pre wrath post-tribulation, you still believe Jesus is coming back. That's the important thing. That's just one example. 
Good men disagree on a myriad of things. But where we do agree is the important things. Okay? Those who are spiritually resurrected are enlightened by faith. They that are in darkness don't get it. And oftentimes will wrest scriptures into heresies and false gospel messages. Gospel truth. When we look at 1 Corinthians 2.14 again, we see the gospel truth is nonsense to the natural man. That sin has darkened and made blind. What people in darkness just don't get, they don't understand that they need to fear the Lord. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Human philosophy says that confusion is the beginning of wisdom. I heard that in philosophy class as a freshman. Confusion is the beginning of wisdom. But 1 Corinthians 14.33 shows that God is not the author of confusion. And Proverbs 9.10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Luke 1.50 His mercy is on them that fear Him from generation to generation. Now, this fear doesn't mean oh, God is coming up! That's what the unbelievers will do in Revelation. They're going to run just like I talked about the cockroaches. And again, I'm not calling unbelievers cockroaches. I'm merely talking about behavior. Just like you turn on the light, they run into the darkness. These people are going to see the Lord and they are going to run into caves and, and pray that the mountains fall on them. Who they're going to pray to? I have no idea. But they're going to. They're going to hope and pray that these mountains fall on them and they die. Which is very strange, when you, having the knowledge that we do, that they're actually going to, they see God, they run to the mountains, they pray to die, and when they die, they're going to have to see God. Anyway, but they don't get that. So, but they don't understand, they need to reverence the Lord. We're not talking about terror, we're talking about reverence. Like a child, a three or four year old child, reverences his mother and his father. They know they, they know that the parents have the power. Okay? They know mommy and daddy are in charge. If mommy and daddy are doing are, are raising their child in the Lord, the child knows that mommy and daddy are in charge. We should know our father is in charge and what he says goes. That is the fear of the Lord. Remember, God chastens those he loves. A spanking is not fun. It's not meant to be. People in darkness do not understand that they are not self-sufficient. I had an atheist tell me, if there is a God, He'll surely let me into heaven. Because I am a sweet and kind and generous person. I help the poor. I love animals. She couldn't accept the world's sinners. I asked her if she was perfect. I asked her if she made mistakes. Of course I do. I'm human. But no matter how much I explained, she couldn't make the connection. It's the natural state of humanity to think themselves self-sufficient when, self when in reality they are self-deficient. Romans 5.12 Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We aren't self-sufficient enough to hold the very atoms of our body together. We need God to do that. What makes us think we're self-sufficient to do anything? Jesus holds the world and everything in them together by the word of his power, including you. People in darkness do not understand that they must avoid the unfruitful works of darkness. Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Romans 13.12, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Why? Doesn't God want me to have any fun? That's the same thought Satan gave Eve in the garden. God's holding out on you. He doesn't want you to do that. Listen. You're not... It, 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 God does not tell you not to sin um, because... Okay, let me, let me go back. I just had one of those brain things. I'm getting old. God is not holding out on you. God is not... He, he's holding... He's, sin isn't, isn't destructive because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's destructive. That's what I was trying to say. Sin will kill you. That's why we need to deal with it. People in darkness without Christ do not understand that they are in prison and sin is a cruel warden. Isaiah 42, 7. One of the reasons that the Messiah would come, the, the Scripture shows us, is to open the blind eyes 
to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Those that are in darkness don't understand that sin is a prison and Jesus came to set you free. Romans 8, 2. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Just like the false Jewish converts of John 8, they, 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 they don't get it. In John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, then, <clears throat> if, and, and he's saying this to, to Jews which believed on him. Okay, Essentially, they believed in vain. But it says they believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And their response was to argue with him. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. That was a lie. They were in bondage currently to Rome. And, the, and their concept of the Messiah was that he'll come and set us free from Rome. So yeah, they were, they were in bondage at that time. So that was a lie. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? They want to argue with Jesus. They don't get it. People in darkness do not understand that they are slaves to their sin. John 8, 34, Jesus answered unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. Romans 6, 16, To whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants, ye are to whom ye obey, whether sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Jesus sets us free, not only from the prison of sin, but of the slavery of sin. Now being made free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Romans 6.22 Another thing people in darkness don't understand is that you can't have both light and darkness. 2 Corinthians 6.14 Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? The religious in darkness don't understand you cannot have both simultaneously. People who are in darkness do not understand there is no such thing as a good person in God's eyes without the regeneration in Christ. Well, I'm a good person. I love animals. I hug my wife three times a week. I'm nice to children when I feel like it. I'm a good person. I don't go out and kick strangers. I don't go out and, and juggle babies. I don't throw little kittens high into the air and see how long it takes them to splat on the ground. I don't do that. I catch them. <laughs> there is no good person, no matter what kind of, of, of nice things that you do, without regeneration in Christ. Romans 3.10-12 as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Finally, the people in darkness do not understand that their darkness is damnation. We're going to go back to John 3.19, we talked about it a couple of times. The condemnation is that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. It's not a problem with the intellect. It's a problem with the heart. Not a problem in the brain. It's a problem in the will. Romans 1.20 says, shows that they're without excuse for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. The message of Romans 1.20, nobody's going to be able to come into God's throne room and claim ignorance. The darkened mind of man rejects the light that is given. It chooses to stay in darkness. His darkened mind, his darkened heart. Titus 1.15, under the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. Jesus is the light that exposes evil in men's hearts, which is why they hate Him. Which brings us to verses 6 through 8. Men do not have their own light. John 1, 6 through 8, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. I once shared the gospel with a man at a grocery store. 
And when I told him that Jesus died for him and was resurrected, he said, I am a being of light. I am a spirit being. Essentially, his new, new age gurus had taught him that he, would, he could be light without God. He could be his own light. He didn't need Jesus. He was his own God. He was a self-idolater. That's an evil heresy. And, it's, and the scary thing is, it's taught by even some of these liberal churches that all men have, and I quote, <clears throat> the spark of divine light that must be fanned into a flame. Sounds nice, but it's dangerous. You might as well put a nuclear bomb in your pocket and set it off. All men are in darkness due to sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not even John the Baptist, who Jesus said was greater than all of the Old Testament prophets. And that's in Matthew 11, 9 through 11. He did not even have his own light. He was not that light. He was sent to bear witness of that light. John bore witness of Jesus. Now, you could say, John, 3, John 5, 35... <clears throat> here says that John the, of John the Baptist, he was a burning and shining light. Now guys, this isn't a contradiction. The Greek of John 1.8 is phos. Okay, we get our, our word uh, photography okay, from that. Photosynthesis. Light. That's the basic. Phos. It's a self-existing light. The Greek of John 5.35 is lichnos, meaning lantern. A lantern contains and carries a light. No man is a source of light. We contain and carry the light of Christ. In some cases, we are even pictured as reflecting God's light. But we are not the light. None of us, not John the Baptist or any other person, is a light unto himself, but the follower of Christ contains and carries the light of the Lord. There are preachers in many pulpits today and on so-called Christian television at large who act like they are the light. They think they can water down and change God's gospel message. One mega church gives their kids coloring books that exalt their pastor and his vision. That's self-exaltation. That's making you self-delight. God's divine light has counterfeits out there. 1 Timothy 1.7 speaks of those, quote, understanding neither what they say nor where they affirm. Colossians 2.8 speaks of those who spoil others through philosophy and vain deceit. 2 Corinthians 11, 13-15 speaks of false apostles who are deceitful and try to appear as apostles of Christ, but who serve Satan himself who tries to appear as an angel of light. John the Baptist's mission was to be a witness of the light, to bring people to a belief in the true light of the world. John was the man who would announce that God had sent Jesus to be the promised Messiah. John was saying God was about to flip the switch and illuminate everything through Jesus Christ. People in darkness without Christ walk in the ways of darkness. Proverbs 2.13 We leave the paths of uprightness and walk in the ways of darkness. Folks, there are two paths that were given in Scripture by Jesus. Matthew 7.13-14 says this, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few be them that find it. The narrow way is the way of righteousness. The broad way is the way most people go. From the atheists to those who pervert the Christian faith into some other religion that just looks like Christianity. It's a doppelganger for Christianity. From the atheists to those people they're on the broad way. And it leads to destruction. Pardon the pun, it's a dead end. It is the way of the religious that do not have their spirits resurrected in Jesus Christ. It is the way of un the unregenerated who walk in their own ways. It is the fool of Ecclesiastes 2.14. The wise men's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. Finally, verse 9 of John 1. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The Christ light shines on every man. Now the universalists are going to try to use this verse out of context, of course, to say that all men will ultimately be saved. Jesus 
<clears throat> speaks of those who do evil in John 5.29 as having the resurrection of damnation. Again, let me point you back to the dead end. John 1.9 is a reference back to the Logos of John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Isaiah 9.2 gives us a messianic promise. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. And light is Jesus. John 8.12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Folks, everybody experiences God. Most just don't know it's God they experience. Romans 8, uh, excuse me, Romans 1, 18 to 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. <clears throat> for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Only through faith do we truly recognize the God we experience, but to go beyond, not only that, we go beyond physical experience into spiritual experience. Okay. All right. For those who want to argue, you want to have maybe a question in your head, that's fine. But we're out here, there's sunlight. Every person alive experiences the sun, whether they can feel it or see it. Okay? As we said before, without the sun, there is no life. That means that even the person who is blind, whose nerve endings have all died so that he cannot see and he cannot feel, he can experience the sun just by the virtue of the fact that he or she is alive, breathing, and eating. Because the sun doesn't just shine light. The sun doesn't just give heat. The sun is also responsible for food. Without the sun, there's no food. Because of photosynthesis of the plants, again, the animals eat the plants, we eat the animals, we, okay? we, we eat plants too, I understand. Hello to all the vegans. Don't be offended. All right? But the fact is, even if you're eating food, even if you cannot see, hear, feel, you can't, you have no sense in it at all. The very fact that you're eating is proof that you've experienced the sun. Every man experiences the sun, S-O-N, whether they can feel him or see him. John 1, 3, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. The very fact that there is a creation and you're part of that creation is proof that every man experiences the S-O-N, the Son of God. Listen, the reason sinners can't find the Lord is the same reason criminals cannot find the police. Let that sink in. Of course, there's a lot about light we don't understand, and that's perfectly fine. Light emission is a consequence of an electron jumping from a higher orbit to a lower orbit on the atom. In 1906, J.J. Thompson proved that electrons were particles, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. In 1937, his son, George Paget Thompson, proved that electrons were waves, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics, along with his research partner, Clinton Joseph Davison. So, Daddy, J.J. Thompson, proved that electrons were particles. His son, G.P. Thompson, proved that electrons were waves. Light behaves as a wave sometimes, and other times light behaves as a particle. Even more fascinating than that, now there is evidence that light only manifests as particles when we're looking at them. There is a theory in quantum physics that light might even be what they call a vibration in the fifth dimension. Don't ask me to explain it, I simply read it in a book. Actually, I read it in a couple of books. Okay, I can't explain it. Our takeaway. Light's a mystery. We don't understand everything about it. We don't, we can understand part of it, but we can't understand the whole thing. There's a lot of mystery in light, and there's a lot of mystery in the Lord that is light. That He will reveal to us in due time. And one thing is not a mystery. Our job as children of light is to be His light in His absence. Not carry our own light, not be our own light. We don't have any, but we carry His light. Jesus said, John 9, 5. In John 9, 5, 
As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He also said, Matthew 5, 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. He also said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Our job as light bearers is to take his light to them that live in darkness, to bring them to the kingdom, into the kingdom of light by preaching the gospel and bringing along followers of Christ into his kingdom. We need to get them to defect. Folks, I have almost a tome, it's huge, of pages of notes on light and darkness. But since this is a recurring theme in the scriptures, I'm confident that we're going to visit those as well in the future. In other scriptural contexts. For now, let's bow our hearts before the Father of lights, in whom there is no darkness at all. Hallelujah. Thank you, gracious Heavenly Father, for this day. It's beautiful out here, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've given us, Father God. Thank you, Jesus, for being our light so that we don't have to walk in darkness, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for, for changing us, for converting us, for resurrecting our spirits, for giving us that born again, that regeneration life, the Christ life in us, Father God. Thank you for that, Lord. God, I, 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 I pray, Father God, that this message teaches and touches people, Father. And I thank you for all of it, Lord. God, and I thank you for food, for photosynthesis, God. That's genius. I thank you, Lord. Of course, you're a genius, Father. You're, you're the ultimate genius. You thought of it all. And God, I thank you for all of this, Father God. And I thank you for being our God. And I thank you for being our Savior. I thank you, God, in Jesus' precious and holy name.